bigger crowd. I thought it'd just be me and like two other guys in here. So I'm really impressed that there's a lot of folks here. That's great. Um, so this is pretty exciting. We're, I'm going to be talking a lot about the uh, um, using this PC and a modern IDE for developing Commodore d fit stuff. I'm not going to go into a lot of the fancy programming bits because I want to show a lot of the features. So it's going to be you know, not a lot of like impressive programming, but a lot of good stuff anyway. So if you get too excited, just feel free to quietly you know get up, walk out in the hall, catch your breath, and uh, you know when you're ready to come back in for, for some more amazingness, you know just step back in. Um, all right, a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in a little town in Oklahoma. It was in the middle of nowhere, literally in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I first got my first exposure to a TI-994. Uh, the library got two TI-99. And that was the first time I'd seen a microcomputer. First time I'd seen a computer at all. Then I met my friend Kenny, who also liked the TIs, and he had a Big 20. And I wanted to uh, go and see his Big 20. And oh man, that Big 20 was great. And then, so Christmas is coming up, and I'm thinking, I want a Big 20. So I'm like bothering my parents, but you know, I want a Big 20, I want a Big 20. I didn't think we could afford a Commodore 64, so I think, all right, I just want a Big 20. And then there it was under the Christmas tree, a box that was like the right shape to be a Big 20. So I'm opening the paper, and I'm like, what? It's not a Big 20, it's a Commodore 64. And like my vision kind of like tunneled and kind of hard to breathe, and like the heavens opened up and I had a Commodore 64. So I was, uh, that started my journey really. So after high school, I, uh, I did join the Army, spent four years in the Army. And then after that, I uh, had an opportunity to uh, move to Minnesota. I spent uh, a lot of years in Minnesota, and that's probably why my accent's hard to pin down. So I've got a little Oklahoma and a little Minnesota. But I had a lot of opportun uh, good companies that I had opportunities to work for, learned a lot. Um, I moved here to New Jersey in 2012, and I currently work for that company in the middle, pronounced ISEMS, not ICOMS. Yeah. Uh, actually, because there was a software system called Sims, so this was about the time of the, you know, all the iMacs and iPhones, so it became iSims, and they sort of stuck with it. Anyway, and two people that work with me are in the audience, so... Um, I don't know if you're big fans of American football, but in American football they talk a lot about coaching trees, and you can tell a lot by a coach from who else they coach for, or who taught them something. So this is, my, this is my programming language coaching tree. Um, all the languages that I was actually paid to learn and paid to use, so you can maybe tell a little bit about me, about the things in that column. And then of course there's a lot of other things that I just learned for free. And uh, this is my programming tree, so. All right, what are we gonna talk about? Man, when I first used my Commodore 64, that screen editor was just unbelievable. After looking at other systems where you had to like edit line by line, and now I've got the screen editor, I can cursor up, and I can edit right there. It was amazing. But looking at it now, it's kind of hard to remember that. That's only 42 rows and 25 columns. Like, itty bitty little postage stamp, right? And the only way you could keep track of things, if you had a program that didn't fit on the screen, you had to have a lot of handwritten notes. I remember having notebooks for like, you know, keeping track of like ghost sub lines and like all these other like, conversion routines and it was, like, it was like a lot of work. But you can still do that if you really want to. You can work on the original hardware. Maybe you have one of the C64 Maxis or a C64 Mini, or even if you're going to use an emulator like we were using today. But why? When you have a computer that can display so much more. So there's three tools I think are really important to make this all work. And we're going to show, like real quick, all three of them. Hopefully you got some familiarity with the Vice emulator. That's uh, been around for a while, it's very stable. And I'm going to be using a tool called Dirtmaster. If you haven't seen that, it's got some amazing support for all of the popular formats from Commodore as far as the D64 and the Tape64 and PRG files. 
cut all that stuff. And I'll show you a little bit about that and tell you why I want to use it. And then, of course, we're going to focus mostly on this thing called CBM PRD Studio. I call it CD, CBM Purge Studio. So I don't know if that's right. That's what I call it. All right, let's do a quick tour of this stuff. Let's see if I can uh, get everything on the screen. All right, so a little nice thing here, right? So uh, let's make it white so we can see the font a little better, right? All right, very familiar, right? You can uh, type this little program that everybody's seen like a hundred times, right? Run that. Um, now, Vice is also cool because you know if you want to clear the screen beforehand, you could do something like that. That's what you expect, right? But, um, it also kind of does some good keyboard mappings for you. So if I don't want to do this sort of thing, and this does not look familiar to you, right? So if I do this, and it has the keyboard mapping, so I can do that. Everyone remembers the reverse heart, right? So, same results. All right, so, Vice. Good enough. You know you also can attach a disk image, you can attach to a D64, you can, you know, load dollar, you know, comma eight, and you can do all those things. But there's a lot easier ways to do it when you're on a Windows machine. So let me kill this and show you something else. Alright, so I had an opportunity to extract all of my Commodore floppies to D64 files. And that probably is a whole talk amongst itself, but I'm not going to really focus on that. But there's a lot of ways to do that if you have questions how to get your old floppies onto D64 files. Anyway, so I've got an association here with uh, the Durmaster program I was talking about. There it is. This is a disk I made in, uh, I think I made this disk in 1983. And this is an image of it. It's got some cool stuff because you can double click on one of these listings and it will actually give you a listing. It actually does all the conversion for all the pesky characters and things like that. You can't edit this, but it's a nice little display. And something else really cool here is that you can create new disks. And it's really easy to manage these things because you can copy things. I don't want to copy that. Let's copy this mini frog thing. You can copy things to other D64s by drag and drop. Very cool program. Um, you can also take these things and you can uh, extract them out to uh, PRG files or other binary files and things like that. Super helpful. All right. But the cool thing I want to show you real quick this program Thief. Thief was one of the first programs I remember actually writing. I had seen one on the TI-994A, this program that where you try to guess a combination of a safe. And uh, I wanted to make my own version. So I remember making this. I think I had my computer for like four months when I made this program. So it's pretty bad. Uh, but anyway, so in the options here, oops, I'm sorry. Yes. In the options, you can specify an emulator and you can run it directly based on a hotkey. So I have a map to my Vice simulator here. So what happens is, from I can select one of these programs on this T64 file. I can say I want to run it in that emulator. That's the program. So this program, like I said, made it when I was, uh, I guess I was a freshman, freshman in high school. And you're supposed to do this, uh, little thing where you kind of try to see if you can get the combination and there it is and there's the first digit and if I uh, run out of time it's going to get me here but maybe I'll get one time if you're really there. Ta -da. And I really didn't know I, was, I had bad spelling apparently back then too. Um, Alright, so I'm going to slow down and I'll get caught this time. I'll just show you the whole thing here. Alright, shouldn't take too many ticks and uh, I'll get caught. I remember when I did this too, I remember the, the position on the screen for the safe, I just started drawing on the screen editor with the, you know, the, pet, the pesky key and was able to make this little graphic. And I thought it was pretty cool. Then I had to go back afterwards, and you probably did this too, right? You go back afterwards and you have to put like, you know, 10, print, quote, and then if I wait till the end and close that quote, and uh, I, I did that get this into the program. Anyway, um, you also see I also had another I don't know how to spell issue here in a second. Yeah, I'm an amateur? I don't know. Alright, so that's how I can launch this from a D64 file uh, using Dirtmaster. It's pretty cool. But, now let's get really cool. Alright, this is a CBM uh, Perk Studio like I was talking about. So 
So I'm going to create a new project. You can specify it targets all the 8 bit machines. I'm going to target a C64 here. And let's call this one. Uh, uh, I don't want to create a Git repo for this at the moment. And I'll give you this little uh, project explorer as a framework here. So for a basic file, I want to um, import the basic file. When I import that basic file, it's going to give me a browser, and I can say, I want to go find in a D64 image. I got it right here, the first disk. And it will read that D64, and it will give me all of the PRG files that it can find on there. Now I'm going to say, I want to import this thief program. And there it is. First thing you might notice here, I've got my editor font hopefully large enough that people can mostly see. Uh, but you can already see I got a lot more on the screen here besides just the 40 by 25, right? Now the other thing you might notice is like, what happened to the safe? Why is the safe all these weird codes? <laughs> um, this is ASCII, right? So it doesn't know how to edit that ASCII stuff. So there's a lot of things that are built into the studio, and I'm going to show you mostly later on, for how it converts. There's two different formats you can convert these into based upon your options, but this will give you the codes. So anyway, um, this is the same program that we just saw, and uh, from here, I can build this little program and run it. And I've already hooked in my emulator to the studio so it knows about it. And there you go. It loads that to a PRG file, loads it in the disk, and there's the same program. Come from CBM first. Alright, I know that was magic. Hang on, let's go get back. Alright, let me keep track of where I'm at. Uh, oh, yeah, we're going back to the slideshow for a second. Okay, um, so this, uh, this has been around for a while. Written by this guy named Arthur George. He actually wanted to do it for, he was, he was going to start a project at work. And it's going to be using BB.net, and he'd never used BB.net before. So he said, I want to do a side project. He was kind of passionate about Commodore things, so that's what he did. He learned BB.net by creating this development environment. There were a lot of different uh, similar, like, individual tools at the time. There was, like, this Talk 64 thing that did, like, this pet speed to ASCII conversion, and there were lots of other different tools that did things. And he didn't actually uh, import them. He actually kind of rewrote them all and bundled them all in. Uh, it goes way back. Like I said, he first released it in 2011, and he still keeps it up. Uh, about every two years or so, he will release a new version. Um, it's free, which is cool. Feel free to donate. I think he appreciates that. Um, but it's not open source. So you can't go and build it yourself. You can't go modify it, things like that. So he does keep that pretty close and tight to the best. Uh, but because it was BB.net, that means it's built on a Microsoft.net framework, which means that if you're not using a Windows PC, you may have to do some things to get it to run. It is possible to run it on both a Mac and on a Linux machine, but uh, there's, there's tutorials out on the web that will teach you how to do that if you're not using a Windows PC. Uh, all right. This is sort of like the big feature list. It's a lot. This is why I think the, this tool has more traction than there's a, several different, uh, you know, your VS Code. A lot of people use VS Code for a lot of development now. And there's plugins that can kind of do some of the pieces that we're going to talk about, but not all of them. So this is why I think this, this uh, really has, um, oh, I don't want to say market share, but if it's free, does it have a market? I don't know how to say that. It's, it's popular. Modern. All right. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, we're not going to really go all of it, but I do want to show you a lot of the code editing stuff. The screen editor, which I think is pretty awesome. The sprite editor, and we'll talk a little bit about the assembler if I don't use all my time talking about the other stuff. So let's see how I do. All right. Oh, uh, man, I have one more slide I want to show before I do that. Okay. Code editor. This is what I'm going to show you first. Um, wow. The auto numbering. I wish I would have had that back in the day. Um, auto complete. I think Commodore Basic is pretty straightforward, so you don't maybe don't need the auto complete. But there's an auto complete there. Um, the white space. I think for me personally, why I use it is the white space. I can like put all these things in there, 
and then the before I build the program, it actually compresses all that white space and removes some of the preprocessor stuff, so I can do all this now, but when it comes over to the C64, it's already optimized the code and shrunk it down. Um, the renumbering tool, I'm going to show you the renumbering tool a couple times. And I think you also saw how I had a project, and it, you can put multiple files. So you can put like multiple basic files, and it will like smush them all together for you in a build, which is pretty cool too. All right, so let's try it out. All right, let's close this project. And I'm going to try to leave. C64 project. Let's call this one. Nothing that impressive, but if I list this, you'll also see that all that white space and whatever, it's all gone. All right, let's make it better. Let's do something else. Let's talk about um, let's talk about the renumber thing. All right, so I've got these this section here. I want to add some more code between this hello world and this little you know this little uh, loop that's going to print out some characters. If I select a piece of text. I can renumber just that text, and I can specify where do I want the numbers to start at, what the increment is, so yeah, I'm going to say start at 100, so then it just takes that block. If I had things inside this block that were go shoot or go subs, it would actually recalculate those and put, give me the new line number, which is pretty cool. Um, if I didn't select this as a block, I could just renumber the entire program. I'm probably going to do that a little bit later, so we're going for that. Alright, it's more space here. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, let's do a oh, let's do a screen code. Yeah, let's do that. All right. So same as I showed you in the when I was in Vice, and it knew how I could do like certain you know code. That's how I got the little reverse heart to clear the screen. Um, can't do that exactly here. But what I can do, if I open up a quote, um, there's a screen code builder. So in this, or you can hit F4. Screen code builder gives me a keyboard or this key map or this handy little key codes thing here. And so from there I say I want to I want to clear the screen. And I want to turn the text white. It gives me this little kind of like workspace here that I can mess around with it. But then when I say update, it's actually going to take that, pop it into that where my insertion point was back in the code. So I'll update that and there it brought that in there. So that's going to when I do this and bring it over to the Ingulator is going to give me the actual part and then the little E, the reverse E for written at white, so that's kind of cool. All right, uh, okay, let's talk about comments. Um, this is a pretty typical comment, right? Uh, everyone knows this one. That one's no different. That will actually get in the code and it will come across and it will still be there. Uh, there are two other types of comments that this editor supports. Uh, one, let me add something more in here. 
Block here, these two line block that I, I want to have a listing only comment. A listing only comment is an exclamation and a dash. And when I compress this and send it over to the emulator, it removes these listing only comments. So these are just for me to see and kind of move and keep things arranged in here. There's also a really cool block comment. So if I go in here, I, you know, this little loop for the Printing out the characters, I want to add something here, so I'm going to go to uh, Edit and then the Comment Block. Gives you this little thing where I say, uh, you know, loop through some characters. And uh, what do I want to have as a boundary? I'm just going to draw a nice little box around this. And there. That gives me a nice little block comment. Once again, it's a listing only comment that has the exclamation and the dash, so it's not going to end up in the, uh, the eventual program code, so that's kind of cool. Uh, all right, so I've got this section here, and since I know what this is, um, I'm going to say, let's change this comment to be something more descriptive, you know, wait for a key. There is a thing where you can do regions. Uh, regions allow you to collapse and expand code pieces. So, uh, the best way, you can do that by typing this region thing, but I like this way. So I'll take a highlight a section of the code, under the edit menu, under the selection, there they call it a fold. So I'll take this fold, and it will then collapse that little bit of code. Gives me the little <coughs> region. I can put something after the end of it here. That's where I want to put my commentary, really. For, I guess. So when you're working with like large chunks of code, it gives you an easy way to kind of collapse things into kind of say these are like things, and I know what they are. I'll keep them out of the way. So the regions are. Pretty uh, oh, yeah, let's do this. Um, all right, so loops. You know, uh, let's make this a little more interesting by jumping over a few characters along with the loop, mostly just having a line. Let's do it so it's uh, going to be going across. All right, so I always wish I could do this back, back before, but um, so now I've got these, like, there's this indent and uh, uh, outdent, so I can move that over so it actually looks a little bit more like a modern programming language so I can kind of keep track of like what the heck is going on between these loops. So that's really neat. Um, okay, I think that's the pieces I wanted to show. Let me see if I've missed something. I'm trying to keep my notes here because I just made this last night. Um, oh yeah. Alright, good. Oh I know what I need. I need for this after I press a key I want to the screen again. That's what I forgot. See, I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. I didn't actually have to go into the screen code thing and just type the same thing with that, uh, that format. All right. So, uh, code looks a lot different. Code doesn't quite look like C64 basic in some ways, but it's pretty cool. All right, let's go look at it in the emulator. No surprise there, cleared my screen, waiting for any key. There it is. So if I list this though, wow, that's all it came out. So all the other good stuff with my white space and my indenting and my regions and my other listing comments, all gone. Pretty cool. Alright, let's do one more thing and then we'll get back into the other bits. I want to, I told you how I can have multiple boxes. So what I want to do here is create a separate basic file, add it to the project. We call this one subs. Alright, so in this new file, I actually want to take, this is sort of a simple subroutine, you could say in some ways, so I want to take this piece out. I wish it had a, a nice extract to file with it. Alright, so that's kind of cool. But, so now it's a subroutine, I really need to have these, these different line numbers. So let's highlight, you know, I don't need to highlight the text. This is my, my, my whole file here. So I'm going to go into the uh, renumber. I'm going to say, let's start that at uh, line 1000. So then handily renames that. Also realize that my go-to is part of that. And it renumbered, change that as well. Pretty neat. 
So I'm going to make it a uh, subroutine. I also need to have you know line 1030 here to uh, you know return. Okay. So now I know I've got in this sub stuff basic file. I've got this little subroutine that's going to wait for a key. Starts at line 1000. So take that out. Go sub 1000. But there's no 1000 in this file, right? Where's that going to come from? And, um, but this is going to work, and why is it going to work? Because it's uh, this is more of a project. So I'm going to do a project, and uh, we'll just run this. I think I got everything right. Let's see. Nope. I got an invalid line. Thousand drive. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I've been really thinking way too modern language, wasn't I? Okay. All right, got past the time. So, looks the same, performs the same. There it is. It takes those two files. So you have to be careful. One, I guess, obviously you have to remember to like the line number when you put the ghost us. But you also, uh, it will combine all those basic files together so you can keep things uh, in line. You have to kind of keep watch out for your line numbers so that it doesn't become a problem. Right. Wow, I think that was all the bit I wanted to show on that one. How are we doing time? Wow, it's almost nine. All right. All right, let's try something else. All right. We've talked about the code editor. Now I want to talk about what I think is one of the coolest things I wish I would have had. There's a screen editor. And the screen editor allows you to do a lot of cool stuff and generate this code. So let's go and take a look at the screen editor. All right. I'm going to close this project down. Create a new project. Uh, let's call this uh, screen one. Don't need to get repo. Okay. Uh, in the tree here, there's a thing for screen design. So I can either add a new screen design or there's a way you can add an existing file. So I have actually have one of these prepared already because I want to show you a cool one of one of these builds. So I can navigate over to another folder, choose one of these, and it copies it into this project. Now, the screen editor is a separate tool, so when I click on this, it brings it up in a separate kind of mode dialog. So this is a screen that I built the other day, I don't know, a little border, some grass, I don't know if that's supposed to be a sun, maybe. Um, so this Grid allows you to, you can scroll through and you can click and select characters. Kind of got a nice, nice little pet ski map here, so I can um, pull them together that way. And it's really just sort of like a click and place thing. There's also, from a mode, I'm in this draw mode. You can also go to a uh, a lines mode and a boxes mode. So with the boxes mode, I can actually drag and drop. It looks at giving me a selection area, and then it knows to use pesky characters to draw a box like that. It's pretty cool. There's also a line mode that does similar things like that. And I can also go into a text mode. So let's put some white text. I, because I'm in text mode, I can select into an area here, and I'm just going to start typing. Press any key to continue. Ooh, wait, that did that in portion of case. Portion of case. There we go. All right, so I got this screen. Um, let me save this, and now. I want to put it somewhere. Before I do that, let's go back into the basic file. I'm going to, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, 
export to basic. Give you some option here for the size uh, what you want to have it to generate this code. You want to have it generate the empty rows, where you want the line number to start. Uh, let's do that. It gives you this little actual uh, basic printout using the screen codes from what I just drew on the screen there. I'm going to say copy to clipboard and close. Add a new basic file here. And I'm going to paste that code. And so this is all the code for that screen. I'll do something, one thing like this is a little more interesting. So I want to uh, put a semicolon at the end of that line there. And I want to uh, line 283, let's, uh, you know, wait for it to press a key so it doesn't roll off the screen and print that ready thing at the bottom there. Nothing. And go to 283. All right. So. That's what we just built this screen, we exported it to code. Let's see what it actually looks like in the emulator, huh? And that's the screen we just built. Pretty cool. All right. Uh, let's try something else. I found another program that I wrote a long time ago. And I'm going to do the same thing that we were trying earlier. So let's start off with, uh, yeah, let's just close the project and make a new project real quick. Plus one, plus one. No get repo. Okay, so like I said, I made this program a long time ago. And uh, let's see. Called Quest. There it is right there. So this Quest program has kind of like a little screen I built inside of it. I guess I was trying to do some something there. I never, I never finished this, obviously. Well, maybe not obviously, but I never finished it. But it draws these little uh, mazes. And then in the mazes, you use the joystick and uh, kind of wander around in here. And then once it, uh, it wouldn't let you run into the walls. And once you hit something else, it like, Thought there was supposed to be a different map and it would like, you know, take you somewhere else. Anyway, so that is actually implemented in code, right? As you can see, like the little maps, like uh, the map templates in the code here. So let's try something, see how this works. Alright, I am going to once again go and try on an import uh, basic file. So I'm going to go and I'm going to browse to that disk. Alright, so this is that program that we just saw. Of course, it can convert all those pesky characters over into all this stuff here. And, you know, I want to do a different map. So what I'm going to do here first is, uh, I got this whole section here highlighted that I want to replace this map that was already in the original listing. I can uh, comment out that entire block. Pretty neat, so I don't have to lose that block. Let's create a little space here. Now, I also don't know how many lines my new screen is going to take, because right now this is pretty tight. It starts right off at line 70. So let's re-number this whole program. So I don't have a selection. It's going to do the whole thing. So if I go in here and say, I don't know, let's re-number it uh, starting at 100, and let's go increments of 100 just to see. Just one up. And there. So it just renumbers the entire program. And I've got a lot of space here between 200 and 300 to do something interesting. All right, I actually prepared a uh, screen design for this earlier, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, add an existing file. I'm going to choose that screen design here. Maze. So this is the little screen design that we saw in code earlier, right? Now, because I, I think I made this on graph paper or something, I don't know why I was being so conservative with the size of it. I don't know. I don't remember. But there's no reason to be that conservative because the program like just looks at like you know prevents you from running over a checkerboard character. So I can make this maze anything I want to. So if I can go in here and just erase chunks of this this old maze, if I want, and let's go here and uh, pick the checkerboard, and I can just extend this out, make this a little larger, and keep it safe so I don't crash into things. 
kind of be too interesting here, but just kind of show how this works. Create some other areas now, and you saw that also the uh, it's when I hit the diamond pattern is when the program seemed to know it wanted to do something. Bounce myself in there. So let's put a diamond out here. There we go. Let's put a diamond right there. All right. So I just kind of change that up. Uh, whatever. So uh, if I export this to basic now. Did I do that right? Where do I want to start? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do something between lines 200 and 300. So uh, when I do the uh, export to basic, I'll say start at line 210, increment by one. All right, so that gives me my screen. Copy that. And I'm going to pop it right in this area. And that's it. All right. Is this going to work? I hope so. All right, see how it goes. Build it to the emulator. Wow, there it is. I just extended that maze. And uh, things still work. So I can wander around here. And if I wander and hit that little uh, diamond, it knows that it's still a diamond and jumps me around the thing. So that is a quick, quick, quick way that you can use a screen edit to do some pretty amazing things. Are you ready for more? Can you handle it? <laughs> <sighs> All right. Sprites. Oh, man. How many people had graph paper and you had to design your sprites on graph paper? Right? I used to do that. I think I was supposed to be in biology class and I was supposed to be doing something else. But I remember I used to draw uh, on gra the graph paper they gave me in biology class to uh, do sprites a lot. All right. Anybody recognize that balloon? Mm -hmm. Right? That was the first program I ever did that had sprites. It's in the user manual. You know? Right there, where I had the little program. All right, well, this is pretty cool because there's not only the sprite editor, which has a lot of different kind of neat things, how you can manipulate uh, individual sprites and uh, you know, create more. There's also a lot of really cool support in the studio for this. So if I go and create a new project, I'll call this one. When he was building this and developing this, he put a lot of sample files in here. So under the file menu, there's sample programs, there's basic programs and assembly programs. And most of these are all programs that were from the user manual and the programmer's reference guide. So if I go to this uh, balloon program here, this is that up, up, and away program that everybody has seen many, many, many times. Although I actually want to make, I do want to make two changes so that you can see it better on this. I want to change the color of that, or change the vertical size. I want to change the horizontal size. Right to 29. And also, I'm going to get, because if you remember, this was like cyan colored when this program first comes out, and so uh, I want to make that sprite uh, white. Alright, just to prove that I'm not lying, let's look at it in the emulator. And that's the program we're going to look up. Alright, the sprite editor. You can start from scratch, obviously, but there's a really cool thing here, because right, these data statements are all what's defining that one sprite. So if I open, uh, let's go to sprite data. Say, uh, add a new, we'll call it, we'll call. Um, when I open up the sprite editor, it gives me an option to import from a listing, from memory, from a bitmap, from a binary file. I'm going to say from a listing, because I have a listing I, I know includes one sprite. And when you're importing sprite data, you can choose, if you know where the sprite's at, you can say if there's multiple, how to handle it. But I'm going to say this really cool thing called find sprite data. It's going to take that listing that I've got open behind me here and it's going to parse it and try to find a sprite. And it does. There's the balloon sprite that it parsed out of that data. Now you can do a lot of things here, right? You can flip it left and right. You can flip it up and down. Shift it up. Uh, shift left. 
shift right. Um, this product editor gives you a lot of cool things. You, you can also, uh, there's this kind of, uh, kind of scroll bar area here. You can actually load a series of sprites. So if you have an animation you want to do. So if you have one, you can copy it to a second sprite. Then you could like, you know, flip it or rotate it or move it around so you could do an animation. And there's a scratch pad here. I've got a bunch of sprites loaded that you could like play around with that animation. Uh, I've only got the one sprite, so you know, I can't do much of it. And it gives you some way that you can like mess around with like putting sprites on top of sprites and sending priorities. So it gives you a lot of cool things you can do if you're trying to do an animation there. But anyway, back to this one. Alright. Um, let's change it. So uh, you know, so I have the Commodore logo, which you know, we all love the Commodore logo. Let's try something else. I am want to do, since we're here at PCF, let me see if I can somehow put a little V and a little I don't know if that's C, yeah, and uh, an F. All right, let's try this at PCF. I guess yeah. All right. So. Uh, same as like the way that the screen editor allowed me to export to code, I can export this sprite now too. So uh, first of all, I know this data section here. Um, I don't want to put it over it, but you know, I like the comment thing. So let's comment out all of that old sprite data. I know I can start somewhere, anywhere I want to after 170. So uh, let's export this to a listing. And I want to start at line number, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Let's start at line number 1000, why not? And uh, there is the newly exported data for that sprite that we just created. We modified the Commodore to put the BCF logo in there. And let's see what it looks like. Let's give it a shot. There it is. Wow, PCF, look how easy that was. Like an existing sprite that you could pull in from any program that has sprites in it. And uh, it took me two minutes, right, to modify that and you put a cruise sprite. Okay. Uh, all right, close in later. Let's see, we're almost, we're doing okay on time. I'll see if I can go through this next section. Let's see how quickly I can do that, because I wanted to talk just briefly about um, the assembly language features this thing has. Uh, it kind of uses its own version of assembly. I know Kick Assembly has been a real popular one in the Commodore crowd recently. Um, it, it's a good three pass assembler. It's got everything you probably want related to labels, variables. It's got a way you can create a neat little basic loader or the syscall. I'll show you, try to show you that. Um, but there's actually a lot of good information out there. Um, it's not that dissimilar from an old Commodore, but a lot of the other you know, C64 MASMs out there, so it's not going to be too, too, uh, too alien if you've done a lot of assembly making. All right, let's try this. I'm going to, of course, start off with a new project. File this time, I actually want to do an assembly file. And because I don't want to have to type all this in, I actually did pre create this. So I'm going to add it as an existing file. There it is. Alright, so this is a real simple little program that's going to clear the screen. Uh, this is going to set the, you know, the background and the border to red. A couple things if I don't know, if you know assembly that well, but I'm mixing things here, which is pretty cool, right? I've got some uh, regular values, I've got some hex values, I've got an integer value here. But if you don't know, I mean, I didn't know this, but if you know D020 is actually 53280, you know, from hex to decimal. Uh, but anyway, uh, you recognize those as old poke statements, right? Uh, I'm going to put uh, you know 65 into the X register. Uh, put then to A, this JSR actually prints what's in the uh, accumulator. Increments it, compares it to if I've reached the 91, and I'm looping back to this uh, moving the x to a. So, what this is basically going to do is just going to print out ASCII, you know, A to Z. That's what it's going to do. Alright, so, uh, you know, and I'm starting at this at uh, the beginning of the basic, right? Which is, uh, I don't remember what the hex 0810 is. But, uh, oh, it's 2064. Uh, Alright, so, what's this going to look like? Let's do this real quick. Uh, go first. 
program. Um, oh, hang on, I have a process error. Uh, you know, I had this problem happen to me last night. I had to like open it and then reclose the project again. Hopefully, get through this because this was like really messing me up last night. I didn't know why this was happening. Project file first. All right, no preprocessor errors. All right. Well, that's all just up in the emulator. Doesn't do anything, right? You're like, why did it do anything? Well, because it just put it in the memory. It didn't actually execute anything. But if I know that I started, oops, this uh, program starting at 2064, there's the program. All right. But that's like crummy. You just saw how awesome that was. Well, it's all those basic programs. I just like pulled it into the emulator and like automatically runs it, right? Well, of course, there's an easy way to solve this. So give me a couple lines of white space here. There's an, under the tools here, I can either generate a basic loader or I can actually generate a syscall. I'm going to generate a syscall here. Um, it says where do I want to start it at? Do I want to comment? Uh, you know, I want to start it at the beginning of basic. There it is. So it puts something right there, gives me this little loader. It's basically all it's going to do is basically say sys2064, which is this label right here. So now, if I build this, Actually, the program. So the syscall is a neat little handy way to get, get into that. Okay, wow. I think we are 11 minutes left, so I think uh, I've just about made the time. Um, so I didn't talk about everything. Remember that long list of features that I brought up at the beginning? I didn't. But I did talk about the sprite editor, the screen designer, the screen code builder. We saw that. Um, most of the, all the editing stuff, but there's things we didn't talk about. The character editor, there's a character editor that is just as fully functional as that sprite editor and that screen designer. And you can actually take, once you have a character editor, you can actually bring those into the screen editor and have your custom characters on the, on the, uh, in the screen editor. It's very cool. Um, I've never much into music, but there's a really cool SID tool. I haven't really made much with it, but it's, it's also built in there. Um, the assembly language I just showed, I showed you, there's a built-in debugger, so you don't have to use the vice debugger. You can actually do a little memory map and actually see things right there in the IDE. There's a bunch of cool basic constants that are built in. Um, really worth it. All right. What should you do next? Have I inspired you? I don't know. Have I confused you? Perhaps. But the tools are all free. Um, I'll post them on the Discord channel where the links are. The, you can get all these things I showed in the, Dur the Durmaster, Vice, and the uh, CBM Pro Studio, it's all there. It has a really good help file. In the help file, there's tutorials. And you saw the other thing where I could generate sample programs. There's a lot of ways you can get stuff out of there. Um, there's also um, books. There's a guy, he's not the guy who made the, 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 the program, but the guy, he goes under the handle Old School Coder. He actually has published, there's two books on Amazon that he's uh, written about how to use these tools to develop for C64s. There's a whole lot of YouTube videos, so you can check it out. Um, and then really just try it out. Um, I think the first thing I ever did with this was uh, I wanted to take it and I built it to a D64 file and I put it on my C64 Maxi and wanted to see it run on like, well, almost real hardware, so it's pretty cool. And that's all I got. I guess we've got 10 minutes, so uh, you can like take a breath, you just like soak in all this amazing things, uh, think about all the things you want to do, or ask some questions. So, what do you got? Um, so the IDE, you said, you remember how it changes the Penske characters? Can you display the characters? No, so the question is how in the IDE that we were showing the, uh, the all the character codes. Let's see, do I have one of those very quickly? Like your maze, right? Yeah. I wrote a lot of programs like that too. So the question is, is there a way to get these back? And the answer is no. So the uh, there are two different formats for this. I don't know if you can see this very well. But in the options under the uh, basic code generation, these are the two standards. Talk 64 is the one that I like. So that's the one that I first used. It's the older standard. There's also a bass text format. It's 
uses forens and different codes that's very similar. Uh, but I think that was one of the trade-offs he made, and that's why I always use that Durmaster tool and have that around, because if I want to see uh, that what that used to look like, yeah. they actually put a lot of effort into being able to display those like this. So that took me a while to get used to that, because I was used to like being able to like just look at the code and like see it and uh, see the, the images like this. Um, but as I started getting used to using the screen designer for everything I did, it kind of bothered me less. I'm not sure if that helps, but yeah, that was my first reaction too. I'm like, I want to see this. I'm like, I'm looking at all this stuff. I don't see all this and all these like 166s and stuff like that. Good question. Though. All right, anybody else? Uh, yeah. What's the support like for uh, this files? I mean, I saw you using Mercury Master, Mercury Master Frame. Things in, but if the program reads and writes to files, like you open, you know, Acon and you know, output channel and one, where does it send these? And can you see those files in the directory? Okay, so the question is really like I was doing a lot of things where I was compiling things, I was putting them into PRG files and uh, D64 files, and where do they go and can I see them before I run them in the emulator? And the answer is it is all in. I'm not sure if you can build this. Hope you can see this. Okay. So here's all those project files I was creating here. It actually builds them to, this is to a PRG file. That was a subtle difference. I'm not sure if you saw that or not. But sometimes when I was going to the build menu, I was saying I want to build the program. Sometimes I was saying I want to build the project. When I build the program, it creates a .prg file. And that PRG file, you can look at it directly it's a really, that, this is that PRG file that I had there. It's got one program called Quest. That's one. Um, I could, it's a, and it's a, that .prg is a format that the, that Vice knows how to deal with. You can actually mount that directly with a run, with a parameter. That's actually what it does. Uh, if you see in the output here, if I build this program and run it, it actually uh, starts the emulator and it passes in the parameter for what the thing it just built for us. And uh, as well as, uh, like if I do it and I say don't build the program, but I say build the project. So I did that for something. Was it ASM? Yeah, well, there's a there's PRG file. There's a way that you can also uh, build a D64 file. That's probably, that probably answers the question is that you can build it out with D64. I guess you did say that, but then you moved it over to the, to the new hardware. Yeah, which is just as easy. I'd say you, just, all I, you can take any of those PRG files and create a new disk image here. Uh, it says it's got them all, P64, all the way through anything else you think you possibly want. Um, so I could create a new image here, and I could take any PRG file and move it around. Um, actually, this tool is like crazy helpful if you're dealing with anything off of uh, an emulator back under real hardware, you've got to have this this term master tool. Well, that's great. I have not heard of that. The other particular device has been around a few years. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All right. I've got another couple of minutes. Anybody else? Um, so, have you written any modern large programs using this? I wrote this Hammurabi program. And that's when I first started realizing that I started that program during COVID. And I started writing it directly when I got my Maxi. And I'm like, that's when I started going like, God, this is impossible. I can only see this much of the screen. I'm like taking nine written notes again. So that's when I started, I looked around. I first started to use VS Code, and I wanted to use VS Code for that. I, I tried some plugins, and uh, it was okay. But like I say, VS Code has even more problems with not, not knowing Petsky. Uh, and then I stumbled across the CPM Perk Studio and, like, and that changed everything. And I was able to, that's one of the first things I did, like how do I create multiple basic files so I can have all this program logic put in different spots. You know, I've never, I used to know how fast this was as far as I open, close, created projects, it's super fast. And anyway, like the, the code and then all the artifacts are like really small, right? Uh, so I haven't, I haven't had no problems using any large program today. Yeah, this is really cool to see. Thanks for sharing. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Enjoy.